Well, our speaker today is Executive Director of the National Secular Society. He's been at the helm for nearly 20 years, I believe. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. 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 Um, and in 2007, he received the Distinguished Service to Humanism Award from the International Humanist and Ethical Union. He writes regularly for the New Humanist magazine and often appears on radio and television. We're delighted that he's come to speak to us today. So will you please give a very warm welcome to Keith Portiswood. Good afternoon everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. And everybody can come. No, no. Okay, that's good. Well, thank you very much indeed for the invitation. Um, and I'd like to congratulate the committee members of the group um, for uh, such a obviously well organised and warmly welcomed and well attended meeting. Um, and uh, if uh, the whole country had uh, meetings like this, um, I'm sure we would be in a better place than we are now. So, so well done. I'd also like to bring uh, the best wishes uh, from the Council of Management of the National Secular Society to you all this afternoon. Um, and indeed, uh, perhaps the, the President himself will, will reinforce that at the end when uh, he's come down with me. Terry Sanderson, who's at the back in green and blue now. Um, and he may well uh, join me for the question session. Um, I think that we're also think it's important that as many groups in the country affiliate to the NSS um, and you are a long-standing affiliated group for that we're grateful too. Um, I want to make this uh, talk as interactive as possible. Um, uh, it doesn't seem a lot of point in it being a talking heads exercise which you could do almost as well just by reading something that we've written. So I'm going to leave a good space for, um, uh, for questions at the end. And perhaps you can think this while you're going along about, uh, about questions that you think will be, will be appropriate um, and uh, uh, how you could best express them. Um, I'm very lucky. Uh, we really hope that I've been doing this job for the best part of 20 years. And I must say it's a bit of a shock for them that I haven't really counted them. But um, uh, yes, it's true and I'm very lucky. I've got what I think is the best job in the world. Um, and uh, I really enjoy doing it. And people occasionally say, well, is it a full-time job? And the standard answer is, well, 75 hours a week, does that count? I don't know. <laughs> so, um, but it's a job that's taking me all over the world uh, and to all sorts of fascinating places um, that few people are privileged enough to go. But it's not actually a, but if that sounds like it's a real job, um, not always. Not always. I mean, sometimes these places that you go, you aren't being invited just um, uh, for, uh, for the, the social side of it very much. You're going for to put a, a very serious point, um, and very often one that is infuriating many of the people that you're doing it to. Uh, and uh, you don't go to the, um, so let's say, the Human Rights Council of the United Nations and just sort of wander on and say a few words and. and then go and do the skiing in the Alps or something in Geneva or perhaps. The, uh, it's, really, uh, it's really heavy stuff. And um, I remember an intern sort of saying to me the first time I did, Your, and it was about taking on the Catholic Church on Charlie Dukes, which we'll come back to later, um, something which I spent a lot of time. Um, and they, uh, they said, you're not at all nervous. And I said, no, this is payback. <laughs> and uh, I really, it, was something, it took me seven years to get to that point and all the preparation and, uh, and everything, but uh, it was something that I got a great deal of, but when I say satisfaction, I it was pretty nerve-wracking, but it was, uh, it was something that had to be done, and uh, that the Holy See, as they like to call themselves, rather than Holy Trinity, Vatican City State, the Roman Catholic Church, and the di diplomatic uh, name, Holy See, um, were absolutely living. Um, there we are. They don't, uh, they don't get it up very often, but they did. <laughs> 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 
Well, yes, I have to say, we actually, on the way down, we actually had to stop uh, to do a newspaper interview on the, 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 the uh, church has just come out with, with, uh, with all his smiling promises, <coughs> uh, is saying that, uh, oh yes, they really are going to take on climate change and uh, uh, it, uh, they can have a special initiative and all of that. And so we were asked what we thought of that. And, uh, uh, we pointed out that uh, perhaps the biggest risk of danger to the future of the planet is actually unsustainable population growth. And what is the biggest motive of that? Uh, it is the lack of contraception, and what should be done, obviously, is the greatest amount of contraception. And rather than the Holy See using illegitimately its position at the, Holy See, at the United Nations, actually to frustrate them. Um, and uh, so uh, we didn't think they were. They were, they were through their dogma and their blindness, they were actually uh, resisting the very thing that would actually be the best single uh, contribution uh, to the climate to and into the market, into the bargain. A few uh, unexpected other bonuses, like a um, uh, significant reduction of, of diseases like AIDS, uh, reduction in uh, female uh, mortality at birth uh, and, and indeed uh, child poverty. All of those things uh, were they to actually embrace contraception rather than, uh, than to oppose it. And that's our opposition isn't just in the church, or I have to say the leaders of the church. I think a lot of the people in the church see how stupid it is. Uh, but of course they're actually using this illegitimate position at the United Nations to block uh, aid deals unless there are uh, bans on home contraception built into them, which is uh, wickedness isn't a word but it's in my vocabulary, but um, it's pretty great uh, what they're doing. So uh, I hope that will get some wide attraction. So that it would make me late to arrive, but it would have, if it had done, it would have been worth it with the greatest of respect to you, and I would have to so strongly about that. Now, let us, uh, not let us pray, no, it wasn't going to be That's what you were expecting, I'm afraid. Um, that 20 year career of mine might well have come to a premature end. Um, but um, I, I'd like just to. Uh, give you a rough, rough idea of where I'm going with, with, with the talk this afternoon. Um, I want just to look both at national and as we've already dipped into the international arena and look <coughs> and see where we are, see some of the things that the NSS has done in recent years, and then come try to draw some kind of conclusion about what happens next and what the analysis is of, of, of where we are. Well, that's quite important. I mean, I, I feel passionately that secularism, after perhaps global terrorism and uh, global war, and I'm not sure global terrorism hasn't got a lot to do with religion, but, a lot of um, but after that, secularism actually is the next most important thing, uh, and everything that goes with it, including freedom and expression. And that's why I'm so, uh, with such vigour and uh, conviction. So, let's be looking at the international side. Um, we're always trying to say uh, and, and make people realise that being secularism, being a secularist, isn't necessarily the preserve of just the non-religious. I have to admit that most of the strongest proponents of secularism are non-religious, but uh, one of the things that the, the, the NSS has been doing over the last 10 years, which is not popular with everyone, is actually to make the point that the, the, the religious can be secular as well. Um, and I think a lot of religious people are, that are quite secular, and it strikes me in, uh, very strongly how, what huge uh, mismatch there is between 
what the institutional churches say as a dogmatic top level, and it always seems to be the most orthodox or extreme level that you want to use that seems to get the scum at the top of, the, of these organisations. Uh, they are so much at variance from what very often the people in the views or their religions are. I'm not sure that's the same in that wisdom, but certainly as far as Christianity is concerned and, and, and the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church and, and, and the Anglican Church. Um, and so uh, the, 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 the surveys actually show that Catholics are slightly more, more liberal than the population as a whole, um, and uh, which puts them at a pretty fair uh, distance from uh, those people in Rome. And I'm afraid I'm not one of Francis's. Uh, having been won over by the beguiling smile. He's, he's a bit better than the previous guy, which wasn't putting the bar terribly high. <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite sure that they both know about the NSS and about me, because uh, we've given them some real grief um, uh, where it hurts. Um, but um, they are, um, the, 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 the people are, are often a lot better, and are getting better and better, and that's a big issue. And the position that, that the uh, power of the institution of the church is, I think, as I say in more detail when we get to the end, is, is in quite a precarious position in many ways. But as far as the international numbers are concerned, I don't think that the proportion, uh, that the, uh, although the number of <coughs> so called non affiliated people is going to rise, it isn't actually going to rise as far as that. Frighteningly rising number of the population as a whole is concerned. So the number is going to go up, the proportion is going to go slightly down. So we aren't in a position where we're going to be able to say that uh, rationalism wins out and we'll get there in the end uh, on, on the force of numbers. Um, as much as I'd love to be able to say that, uh, I've done not that likely. Um, I mean that the need for secularism is very certain, I certainly agree with that, but it certainly isn't going to be handed into, uh, uh, into our lap on a, on a numerical basis. And in fact, that the most uh, Christian nation is now, in 15 years, is now predicted to be something. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> it's a discharge. Absolutely. Well done. Um, and, and then, as far as the, the national church is concerned, Sorry. Could we turn the sound up a little, though some of it's not here in the lower cadence? Yes, fine. Okay. Right. Is that going to easy? I can hear a bit more. I think that's coming across strongly now, isn't it? Uh, as far as we can tell at the moment, yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, if you feel again that you're not hearing from, uh, as well as you would like, just put your hand up again. Please do that. Okay. What was the most Christian nation? China. Oh, no, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> not an obvious one. I quite agree. Anyway, that's, that was the conclusion of the Pew Research uh, Center uh, in, in a study that came out in the last week or so. Can I just clarify that? Do you mean the largest number of Christians or the largest number of Christians that have been population? Now, I could give you a diplomatic answer to that. I read the headline and I'm still to read the study, so I don't know the answer to that question. But, um, it is interesting. It's only just come out, and I, I, I haven't had. I've been stuck in the back of the car to read, and I haven't had. <coughs> it's, I, I did, but the very same question crossed my mind, and I don't know the answer. Uh, but, it, but either way, it's significant. I think, whichever measure you take, and um, it, it's probably the number. But um, I'm, I'm absolutely sure. But Pew uh, Research Institute is the place to go, and, uh, and it was. I was interviewed for the Telegraph on. Uh, in fact, it was the president, I think, beg his pardon, who was interviewed for the Telegraph on that very topic um, a few days ago. Uh, and the, the tenor of it was that the, um, that the proportion of Muslims was going up to some 11% by, um, by, uh, in 10 years' time. And that the uh, proportion of uh, Christians was going into the minority, I think, by most, me by most measures. Insensible measures is there already. Um, but there we are. So, um, that, uh, as far as the national churches are concerned, though, by the time we get to 2030, not only will the number, the, the total number of 
Christians have reduced very substantially. I mean, they, they kind of give you an idea of that. I mean, the, we're now at uh, the C of E membership is a quarter of what it was a century ago. Uh, church attendance is half of what it was 50 years ago. Um, that, that's some that's going something in a population that's risen quite substantially. So proportionally, that's an even, an even bigger drop than, than that. Um, but what I don't think many people have realised is the the, uh, the rate of decline of the evangelical and charismatic and so-called new churches uh, is much less, and in some cases is acting than the others, but is possibly in some cases even rising. Um, so that what what is hap- will happen by 2030 is that the numerical dominance of the Anglican and Catholic churches will actually have disappeared. And, it, and there will be a lar- larger number, a larger proportion, albeit of a smaller overall number, um, of these other churches. Now, from a secularist perspective, that's probably better because the institutional power comes from mainly the Anglicans and, and also to a lesser extent the Catholics. But the others tend not to get involved in public life in quite the same way. But they do take their faith very seriously, and that may possibly rate, uh, lead to other problems that we haven't foreseen. So, um, some of the interesting things that we've been doing recently uh, in the NS- NSS. Um, well, uh, we had our uh, annual £5,000 prize to give uh, the Secretary of the Year prize at a lavish lunch in, in central London was about a fortnight ago and um, there was no contest as to who the winner had to be and it was Charlie Hebdo uh, particularly for their uh, courage in continuing to publish after the atrocity um, our previous year was the winner had been a, uh, a Turkish MP who had stood up against the Erdogan government um, and is in some physical danger uh, and I am shocked to discover that um, Turkey has imprisoned more journalists than any other country. Yeah, this, is an, this is a country that was on, on the, the verge of becoming an EU member a few years ago. And the geopolitical implications of it turning so determinedly to the east and the poorest boundary with Afghanistan <coughs> for Europe is terrifying. And this really, really brave woman uh, uh, who took the prize the previous year uh, well, really deserved it so, so strongly um, as um, a, a beacon of freedom of expression <coughs> and democracy and secularism. She's a, a fanatical secularist, uh, and we work together also in, in, in some international particularly uh, the United Nations. So um, that uh, it was uh, one of the recent things that the NSS was, was, was involved in. Um, another campaign, which is a rather oddball one that we've got involved in, is called is about chance repairs. Now, <coughs> does it be, if any of you have heard of it, could you put your hands up? Yeah. Chancel repairs. Yes, I'll, I'll move further over here. Maybe that will be better. Right. So, chancel repairs. This is how your Anglican church um, can, even though it's not in your deeds, require you to pay for the re- repair of the chancel, these pastors, these pre Reformation churches. Would you believe it? And, and it does happen, and there's a famous legal case. The, about 10 years ago, where uh, a farm had to be sold to realise £500,000 to pay for the child's repair liability and the associated cost because the church took it up to the House of Lords. And um, my, my accounting, my, my background is in accounting, and so I was quite interested in that. And so we're working with ministers, uh, that's capital M ministers, that government ministers. Uh, the senior civil servants, uh, senior politicians, 
uh, and indeed the, the very top echelons of the church uh, to try and find a way through this, this awful, awful business. I'm sure it's a conspiracy on behalf of the church. It was a kind of dead letter um, and, until uh, the beginning of this, uh, this century. Uh, and the church is very cynically trying to um, put a, uh, uh, the, 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 it gets it, it, it money out of, out of people in this, in this terrible way. Uh, and I'm very pleased that the 10 SS members, both uh, particularly two women who we honoured as our secretaries of the, of the year lunch, um, who have actually fought against this and, and, and got money back or got their registrations reversed in a way that no, practically nobody else has managed. And we really have shown the way and, uh, and shown the church to be um, a little less than um, uh, gentle and, uh, uh, and beneficent. So that's um, that is something that caused quite a bit of interest, and we've had quite a bit of publicity for that. Um, and of course, here we are just past Easter. And, um, now, do any of you know what the Easter Act 1928 is? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do realise that ignorance of the law is no excuse. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, it's a very odd piece of legislation, which I have to say isn't in the forefront of everybody's mind. But there is actually a piece of legislation that uh, provides for Easter to be on a fixed day. Uh, I think it's roughly halfway through April. Um, if, uh, if agreement can be reached with the ecclesiastical authorities, or needless to say, the ecclesiastical authorities haven't been. No agreement has been reached. We have tried to encourage the Prime Minister to start the process again. But even the Second Vatican Council acknowledged that in principle that it was a good idea for Easter to be fixed because it does move by over a month and that makes planning of school holidays and, uh, and indeed the holiday industry very much more difficult than it otherwise would be. So we have to part of that. I guess the place where the absence of secularism most hits the, the person in the street it is really in schools uh, and I see quite a few of you nodding there and that's something that we're very very conscious of and we do a lot of our, our work on education issues in recognition of that when the last education bill was going through uh, we did a real uh, heavy bang on, in the House of Lords on collective worship uh, in particular and the bishops who came in were obviously being drafted in, in, in bulk uh, to oppose this and they got very very hot under the collar um, and uh, ended up running to serve, in this case Michael Gallagher was saying, please sir, please sir, the National Secular Society are making a lot of headway in the House of Lords and and, and they're, they're wanting to, uh, to live collective worship as a mandatory uh, requirement and you're not going to let them do it, are you? And he was saying, dear, 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 don't worry, we won't let them do it. And go wouldn't. I mean, just whatever arguments. And, and it was really, really embarrassing. I, I, uh, I had a, a very uh, strong meeting with, with uh, the Lord's Education Spokesman, uh, Spokesperson, for the government, uh, Lord Hill, uh, and uh, several of you honorary associates with me, and he was just stuttering. He just couldn't answer the questions because there isn't enough, there isn't a sane answer to why. How many other countries are there in the world, apart from England and Wales, who require mandatory, mainly uh, Christian acts of worship in every maintained school every day? You're right, none. We are the only ones, the same way as we're the only country to have bishops in our parliament ex officio as of right. And it's no coincidence that the two go together because it's the bishops there that stop it and the government hasn't got the guts to, uh, to stand up to them. I don't think that the religious vote is as strong as the, yeah, as, as the government and, uh, and both parties, it's not just the Conservatives, seem to think. Uh, but 
um, that's what they do think, and it's a real problem to us. But there are some signs of, of the, some signs of hope, um, and I'll come back to that um, uh, at the same at the, when we come to the end. So, uh, some of the precise issues, the more detailed issues we've been involved in, in, in education more recently, it's fascinating. Uh, situation in Stoke Poges in Buckinghamshire where a Sikh school uh, was opened um, and non-Sikh pupils were allocated to this school because there was nowhere else. And of course it's a fundamental uh, inefficiency to have this uh, balkanised education system with so many different faiths and, and, and uh, rather than having the one size that fits all with a notionally secular school or a community school. Um, and that we're now starting to see uh, the painful reality of that. And of course these, these parents were living about being uh, just drafted, their children drafted into this school. And uh, we, we supported them. Um, and, and an extraordinary situation arose with BBC. The Asian Network got hold of this and were apparently reporting it uh, reasonably and uh, accurately. And we just happened to catch one of the book news bulletins and they said, oh, and white parents are objecting to this. How dare! And we, 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 we complained immediately. They kept on doing it. So we complained to the BBC formally. It was rejected. We went up to the next stage. It was rejected. We went up to the next stage. It was rejected again. And then we went to the trust, and we won. But so what that just shows you is, uh, and it's not for the first time, the abusive process within the BBC on complaints, quite apart from the um, the, the appalling uh, uh, portrayal of this as being a racist attitude, which was a very clear implication. Um, so um, that was Stephen Evans, our um, education specialist, um, who, who followed that and just kept on with the hard nodes with the BBC. Um, they said we haven't got our rec record with winning BBC uh, complaints isn't great. My predecessors go back 50 years on, for example, thought of the day, we could, and the abuse of process over all of that is absolutely outrageous, and it's all very well documented. Uh, complaints that have gone to the, the governors and back in 24 hours and then managed to get onto the Today programme with an answer saying no the next day. My goodness, that's going something, isn't it? Or, um, or, or, or uh, complaints going to the governors when the governors were on holiday. All sorts that you know, we managed to prove, they just lied to us and, you know, oh, we missed the post. Yeah, we actually said that, missed the post. You know, just, so the BBC is sort of big uh, bet noir for us in, in many ways. Um, and um, particularly, I mean, not just on a process perspective, but also in the uh, really uh, pro-religious bias uh, on an amazing level. For example, in the, uh, with the protest the Pope exercise when we had uh, virtually, it wasn't the NSS organised the answer alone, suggesting <coughs> the, uh, but, but the, the attitude of the uh, at the BBC to oh, we don't want to talk about that, we mustn't, uh, we mustn't upset his holiness, you know, to absolutely all. So going back to um, the uh, education issues, another fascinating one that we found was where uh, a Jewish school was redacting or blotting out uh, questions it didn't like um, from exam questions, uh, public exam questions. Oh, this is dealing with human reproduction. I don't know if you have been involved with human reproduction, because that really is beyond the pale. But how these people are supposed to get educated in life it, it, it is, is rather a depressing issue about these schools, and that's another of my concerns about these very inward looking um, minority faith or minority denominational schools. Um, so we. Um, we complained about this to our ever vigilant uh, uh, Department Secretary of State for Education. Oh, um, 
or one of the ministers anyway, the one more most relevant for this. Uh, she wasn't bothered at all. You know, uh, well, it's up to them to do what they want almost. Um, I, I mean, I I'm not sure they didn't admit that they knew about it. But, you know, well, you know, that's it, fine. So, um, again, the, the NSF is not known for taking no for an answer. And we went to Ofcom and we said, it is outrageous, the, the examination body. And uh, to, to our, I won't say surprise, but certainly relief, the, 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 the chief executive said, my goodness, this is awful. Um, and, um, and overrode effectively the, uh, the ministry and said, we're not having this. Um, and um, it, it, was, it was stopped. But it does raise the wider question about how these kids are being educated and if that can happen. Um, in the implications, they don't get education in these kind of areas, like, uh, including every, uh, the next one after human uh, reproduction, is probably evolution. Uh, and um, uh, that, uh, that battle, I think, is still to be won, but uh, we've made a big dent in it, and uh, uh, they're, they're definitely under the microscope. Um, and we've also uh, had another success over sex discrimination in Muslim schools. Oh, well, you, well, I mean, it makes sense, doesn't it? You can only have men teaching science. I mean, why would you want a woman teaching science? I mean, the, the, the very idea, that's what they were saying. And uh, with public money, how dare they? We, we, we cracked that as well. So, um, these are, but it's really quite a, a, a hard job to keep bashing away these things, but it is quite satisfying when you, when, when you succeed, as we have done on, uh, on, on quite a few of these. Um, we're also working hard on trying to get some sane alternatives to RE, and um, that, uh, not alone in that, but it, it certainly is a very important area, and uh, just, the, uh, I think an area where I, perhaps the NSS stands out there is, I mean, we, we think that this, that how much time do you really need to actually just familiarise people with the main nuts and bolts of the various faiths? Yes, they have to know what they are. Up to general education. I think, do you really need an hour a day, an hour, an hour, an hour a week, or perhaps an hour and a half, uh, for 10 years to go over that? Of course you can. Know. What, what that is is very clear. It's, it's indoctrination by repetition. Um, and, um, and we don't think much of that. We'd like to see a lot more work on citizenship, on uh, thinking skills, and, and a much broader philosophical uh, perspective than there is at the moment. Um, so we keep working on that, but of course it's the, the churches um, that, are, that are really trying to obstruct that. And, and they, they really want it both ways. They, they, uh, uh, such a, uh, an uneven debate. They think it's perfectly reasonable to say, we, and it's in their documents in the Church of England, we want, we challenge those who have no faith. What right have you got to do that, even in a church school? People don't just go to church schools because they want the religion. The, 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 the statistics show that that isn't the reason they go. It's probably the only church, the only school in the, in the area. What right have you got to do that? How would they feel if we said in community schools, anyone who's got a religion, we ought to challenge them and tell them uh, that atheism or humanism was a better route or rationalism? We'd, we'd soon hear about it if we did that. Oh no, that's against the, uh, the, the rights of the, of the children and the parents. Well, you never hear the story the other way around. Um, and the arrogance of that is something I find very, very upsetting. I mean, we were fortunate in, in, in uh, getting uh, the withdrawal of children um, themselves in their own name um, uh, from uh, religious education. It's our very part from collective worship. And if um, any of you aren't aware of that, sixth form pupils can withdraw themselves. And if you know of any sixth form pupils, who want to withdraw and aren't being withdrawn, do tell them they can do it themselves without their parents' um, involvement. 
uh, and without giving a reason. And I would encourage encourage them to do that. Um, yes, that, that uh, I, I haven't finished with that one yet, but um, that was a victory which um, we were pleased to be associated with and uh, to in fact that initiate. So we are also very interested in freedom of expression uh, because we see that as being not just blasphemy, uh, blasphemy that's where we kind of start from it and that's really a very important part of that and um, I know that Terry and I are very proud to have been involved with, with um, in both the House of Commons and the House of Lords in, in the abolition of the, of the blasphemy law in the common law of blasphemous libel in this country and that uh, is something which uh, uh, was a big step forward in the National Secretary of South East in fact separated into celebrate its 150th anniversary has been fighting for for all that time so we're rather grateful that it happened on our watch but um, we're also equally uh, conscious that there, are, that there are very sinister laws that are being brought in um, that are almost worse than blasphemy law, which of course only applied to the Christian Church, specifically the Church of England. Uh, and they are, for example, the religiously aggravated, uh, insulting behaviour uh, provisions of the Public Order Act. Where, would anybody like to, to suggest what the penalty, the maximum penalty for religiously aggravated insulting behaviour is? Death. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping to shock you, obviously. I'm not going to see that. But, um, anybody like T- to. Ten years imprisonment? Not far off. It's seven, actually. And, and that's, I think that's shocking. I admit that nobody's had, nobody's had the full tariff yet. But, uh, and it also, another element of it which bothers us is that it is being, we believe, um, applied in an uneven way. You're much more likely uh, to be uh, charged with that if you're not Muslim than if you are. Um, that's just a fact of life. Um, the fact that there shouldn't be um, and um, in fact this question of the even handedness of justice is something that uh, from a secular perspective I also take very seriously it took me two years to do this but I thought very reasonably I'm mean, going to look at uh, what's on the cutting room floor to see if there's any useful information they could use to charge people and fair enough and cooperate in taking the legal inquiry only to discover the reason the priests were there was with, with a view to, ch- with, to charging men with, raci- with religious or racial hatred. Um, and uh, this was with, with the full connivance of the West Midlands Police and the CPS. And all the newspapers were against them, but they still went ahead. And we, we've got very good evidence that this was being masterminded from Labour the very top of the then Labour government um, and in fact a letter that I wrote complaining about this through the Lib Dems we understand led to Mr Straw losing his temper because he put the answers to the questions were ones that he sure as hell didn't want to give um, so um, we, 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 we fight hard on that and we did eventually get an apology uh, to Channel 4 um, in the House of Lords by the Attorney General, but that took me two years to do, and they ended up paying that hundred thousand pounds. Um, but that was quite an achievement uh, to make the point about the uneven handedness of the uh, of the operation of the law. I think we're now into a slightly better phase on that. I think the awfulness of what was done is now starting to to uh, to be more better known and. Uh, people aren't quite so PC about it. But the damage that was done during that period, um, we're still, re- I, I think, including some of the, the, the extremists that are here, and we appear to be being uh, very naively welcomed in um, by Mr. Blair, who seemed to have the insane idea that if you're polite to these people, they won't do you any harm. Um, 
and I'm afraid we're, that the, that is living on as a problem. But uh, we certainly did our bit to try and uh, um, um, to, to, to make that more publicly uh, uh, known. So sometimes we end up uh, in our campaigns uh, on this general area of freedom of expression and, and, and um, yeah, evenness of, uh, of the justice system being applied. Working with people who would astound you. I mean, I'm slightly embarrassed to tell you, but we work very well with the Christian Institute. Now, we, we, so we have a very sort of love-hate relationship. And most of the time, we're lobbing uh, grenades across the wall at each other in both directions. I have to say. Um, on another occasion, we actually work together, and both the Christian Institute and the NSX have though I should have said, a superb reputation in Parliament for knowing exactly what we're doing and being very good both tacticians and strategists. Um, and when we work together, people have to watch out. And, uh, I mean, apart from the fact it's a wonderful publicity thing, you often see it within, within the play. Goodness, if the National Secular Society and the Christian Institute agree about this, perhaps they're right. Um, or perhaps it's worth listening to. But, but uh, one of our campaigns was about the uh, uh, public order act, the, the words insulting in the public order act. And there's one particular section, section five of the public uh, of the, the order act, which it, it the prosecution thresholds of which are kind of microns high. You don't even have to provide a victim, and it just, it's almost policeman says so, that's it, kind of thing. Police person. Uh, officer. Uh, and so uh, we wanted this insulting taken out of the public order. Neither the uh, <coughs> Conservatives, nor the who in government, or <coughs> the Labour, who are surprisingly authoritarian, I think it would surprise most of you, just how authoritarian Labour, Labour can be, but neither of them were prepared for this to be taken out of the public order act. It's the police loved it, you know, just it's almost, you know, just straight in, we say you're wrong, you're wrong, you get a criminal record. It's just it's just shocking. And we have some wonderful examples of where it's gone wrong, really, really badly wrong. And uh, and so we we lobbed a, a, an amendment into the House of Lords and uh, there had been an, uh, a consultation which the government had, 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 had not disclosed the results of, presumably because they'd been given the answer they didn't want on the screen. In fact, that was the case. Um, and they tried to bluff their way out of it. And the Lord, House of Lords has had a long time there. It's a funny place. Sometimes you think of this, how unbearably courteous. But my goodness, when they think they're being made fools of, they don't take any prisoners, and that's exactly what happened. And the both front benches were absolutely torn apart. Um, I think the government minister looked like she needed psychiatric help afterwards. And we won. Now, you will not find a, 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 a political theory book that will tell you that you will ever win against both front benches. But we did. And that was the Christian, Christian Institute and the NSS. I must say, it was a, it was a, a sweet victory. Um, so, and, and I must say, I got a bit, bit of a kick out of that. So um, we do, and we also, I mean, we we do these training us too as well. I mean, on freedom of expression, partly following on from from the exercise in, uh, over. Uh, which I never failed to point out to them uh, over the undercover mosque issue. Um, and um, so we've been to the National Training College, Police Training College, and Met, and other things. But it's really, uh, they actually think we're wonderful on this, and they really, they, we really put them in under pressure. And, and I think the new generation of police are actually do get it on freedom of expression. So um, that's actually something positive to do, but um, you know, we get quite a lot of. Um, Quite a lot of kick out of. More internationally, uh, I mentioned earlier the, the Holy See um, and uh, as the uh, 
uh, Catholic Church rather self-importantly likes to destroy himself. Um, now this, 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 what I'm about to tell you briefly uh, is about Jean Boost and it's about the matter of falling productivity because what I'm going to tell you took me seven years um, and I have to leave you to decide whether you think it was worth it. Um, but um, uh, I'm working with uh, a, a very liberal Catholic organisation um, on, on some issues of mutual interest and, and I realised from something they said that the Catholic Church is a signatory to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Now this was going on, uh, like that was happening in the context of the full horror uh, or growing horror of the, the scale and geographical extent of, of child abuse in, in Catholic institutions by Catholic clerics and being covered up and, and, uh, and uh, not paying compensation and uh, the, the, the perpetrators being kept away from the judicial system uh, and all the information going back to Rome. Um, but I was putting all this together in my mind and thinking, I wonder if there's a way that we can get the Catholic Church um, police under the convention that it signed itself. It did so for very ignoble reasons. It wants to try and extend the definition of the life of the child back to the time of the conception um, and it's a way of pushing that agenda. Um, but of course what he did at the same time was made it party to this, uh, to this uh, very important convention which you'd be surprised to know practically the only country not to sign is the United, the United States. And it's a long story in itself. But anyway, um, we uh, 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 I ended up going three times to the Human Rights Council and pointing out the awfulness of what the church had done and that it was, and we've taken legal advice, uh, clearly in the contravention of multiple articles of the convention. Uh, and why was it that the church hadn't produced uh, its five yearly reports for 12 years? Late, uh, uh, fairly obvious. But um, did, well, was the Human Rights Council aware of this and why wasn't it happening? And then there was the Vatican that the uh, representative was just where you were sitting there and you know, thinking, ah. <laughs> um, and, and I did this three times. And on the third time, the body language, I'm afraid you've just become the papal nuncio for that. <laughs> I have to say, the papal nuncio is not being um, uh, the body language told me, I just thought, I think you've done it. And I fortunately I said that to the colleague who was with me, and indeed in a fortnight, they had published their response to the, their five very much delayed kind of really report. Not that it said what it should be. There was one paragraph out of 110 that even referred to this issue, and not in anything like the detail or clarity or frankness that it should have done, but it was a start. It did mean that the UN Committee for the Rights of the Child would then start on all of this. So they, uh, I then went out several times to Geneva to see the chair and then later a new chair of the committee to give them some uh, cojones is a word that I don't know when you use, but some should say background. <laughs> biologically inaccurate uh, translation, but uh, anyway, to actually take this on, because there was actually a, a worry about uh, it, it, that, and uh, they're so powerful. Um, and we gave evidence to the committee, uh, and in, 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 with a lot of legal background and including the involvement with Jeffrey Roberts who's written that wonderful book if you haven't read it, it's worth reading The Case of the Pope and actually Jeffrey said to me, you could have read this book couldn't you? And I said, well actually yeah. not, with the, not with the eloquence and the, the authority that you have, but most of what's in the yes um, and, um, and so uh, we really did uh, give uh, a lot of uh, encouragement to the, to the UN Committee uh, and they issued this 
absolutely uh, no holds barred criticism of the uh, of the Holy See in the year past last January, which caused headlines all over the world in, in I think every country of, of, a, of a level that has never been seen before, particularly in some of the countries that absolutely turned into to this. Um, and I have to say that we're not at the end of that story yet, but we've come an awful long way. Um, and uh, as I say, but it did take a lot of But um, that's something that I'm personally proud of, of having been uh, played a very large role in. Um, but the, the uh, I, I made a reference earlier to um, to the Pope and his smile. I mean, yes, he is better than the predecessor. And he's done quite a bit on particular uh, money laundering. My goodness, that was so bad at one stage they wouldn't even <coughs> take credit cards in the, in, the, in the Vatican Museum. Or couldn't. But um, uh, it's really, uh, he has not gone very far on child abuse. He keeps saying all the right and what's appeared superficially to the right things. But there are some. <coughs> really bad things which aren't so obvious and, and I think are, 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 suggest that he, he isn't doing it properly. One is that uh, he is actually trying to pretend that the, that the Holy See is only responsible under the convention for what happens in the 110 acres of the Vatican City State rather than the organisation which it is by in its own words the Supreme Government. Um, and uh, in a practical way, we have a fascinating situation with the uh, a, a papal nuncio, who uh, the Dominican Republic, who is uh, uh, being charged with child abuse, was parachuted back to Vatican. Vatican. Uh, the Dominicans want to have the child, the trial there, where all the witnesses are, all these kids. Uh, the Vatican won't have anything to do with it. Um, and the trial, which is supposed to have already taken place, hasn't taken place, and the, the guy was reported wandering around the streets of Rome quite freely. So, um, it's uh, now the idea that Francis doesn't know anything about either of those two issues, <coughs> from the, uh, the way that uh, the, 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 the replies are going to the United Nations and to this about this, his own representative in the Dominican Republic, stretch credibility beyond. Uh, I think he said beyond belief. <laughs> Other areas that uh, we're very interested in um, are women's reproductive rights. Um, the, uh, we have a big fight also with uh, over the Catholic Church trying to uh, keep away from uh, following the law that applies often just the same as it does in England in uh, not discriminating in uh, adoption agencies uh, on people's belief, marital status and Indian sexuality. Um, we had a huge fight in the Scottish Government over that. Um, we were working quite a bit on uh, women's rights relative to Sharia uh, and I'm working with a peer who's put a bill into the Houses of the Parliament uh, called the Arbitration and Mediation uh, Services Equality and trying effectively to put a, an equality map around Sharia to the extent that you can. It's very, very difficult making any progress there. It's a lot easier in the House of Lords where people don't have their seats to defend. But my goodness, it's hard in the, in the House of Commons. It really is. They're all frightened to death over there. Uh, uh, religious slaughter, or I should say non stun slaughter, is something that we work hard on and we've made some progress on. I've been doing that for a long time. I don't care whether it's religious or not, the fact is that the, the only exemption to the animal welfare regulations and stunning, pre stunning, are religious ones, of course. And that's starting to take on a new urgency because the proportion of meat that's, that's halal is, is just going through the roof and it's becoming the default use. Unlabeled in all sorts of places now, particularly in institutions 
but it's just easier to have, have our thing rather than perhaps some of the people who don't want it. To, uh, 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 having to eat it with them, perhaps not even knowing that we're trying to work, we're working hard on that. Um, I'm, I'm afraid I've just had a fight with the Secretary of State for uh, local government, Mr. Pickles. We had a, a high court victory on council prayers where uh, it was uh, ruled that they were unlawful. We couldn't summon councillors to come and pray. And he was always very rude and dismissive of that and uh, he didn't, but he has to say he doesn't seem to truly be terribly careful about what he says he says oh no it, it, there's nothing wrong with having prayers before council meeting oh well, so that's what we said we said that to the high court we said that to the local authority we don't have a problem having saying prayers before the council meeting what we don't want is having prayers during the council meeting if people want to go into the next room before the before the you know five to two and, and, and talk to whoever they want to that's fine, uh, and get guidance. Uh, I have no problem with that. But I'll let, let the meeting properly start uh, without that. But he keeps lips representing our position and calling us uh, <coughs> intolerant and bigoted, by the way. So this is Anderson's intolerant and bigoted as well. Well, he's, 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 he's had a wank go at me. They brought in a bill. Imagine using the time of the de de Department of Communities and Local Government and Parliament to put in a bill to change this. So that people could say prayers before council meetings. That's what he's just ripped to the church line. Well, they could say prayers before council meetings, before our, before our high court action, during our high court action, and after our high court action. What did we waste all this time in Parliament and his, in, in, in his department for? Because if he says, by saying before, it sounds benign. Well, because it's true. Um, so, anyway, he, he's called me for everything in the, uh, the NSS, for everything in the, in the church times. I'm going to exercise my right of reply. My goodness, he isn't going to like what I'm saying. I shall enjoy it. <laughs> Not the most endearing person, but um, here we are. Um, so, um, a wrap up before we come to questions. Um, I think there are some signs for, for optimism. Um, I think that the fact that the the institutional churches are going to have less proportional power gives us a potential opportunity. I think that gradual secularisation of society it must surely be uh, in our, uh, to our advantage. I think the big problem is actually where, where we, what happens with um, the growth of Islam. Uh, and I think we need the need for secularism and to get the state more secular over the next 20 years is absolutely crucial because if we don't, the uh, privileges of the Christians will be transferred across to the Muslims. And, uh, and however much we might have complained about the Christians, uh, I think we might have more to complain about afterwards. So it really, really is important that we actually use this next 10 or 20 years to push for uh, a greater secularisation and separation of, of, ch of church and state. But it's very interesting that uh, Mr. Pickles and indeed uh, Nicky Morgan, the uh, Education Secretary, both evangelical Christians, both acknowledge that uh, they had changed their minds on same-sex marriage after having voted against it or opposed it in the uh, uh, passively or actively in, in the Houses of Parliament. Uh, and that they actually publicly admit that they had changed their minds. I think it's very, very interesting. Um, and, and may show that we are, that we're, we're, we're moving forward. And I was very struck too uh, by uh, the opening lines of an article in the tablet for Catholic magazine uh, this, this week. We always read the opposition's uh, uh, publications. Um, and it said that of the nine leaders in the big TV debate, only one was religious. 
and that was Kantner. And he ain't that religious. I mean, they were saying he had become more religious as he'd been prime minister with the death of his father and his son. Um, but um, he was the guy who was saying that um, uh, his religion was like uh, listening to Magic FM and the children. <laughs> I think you get the idea, don't you? So um, I don't think he really is that religious at all. So, uh, because I put the biggest big problem that we had over um, longer than the time I've been at the helm of the NSX as, as a director, an executive director, is actually the series of religious prime ministers since, including them since Margaret, Margaret Thatcher. Because each time, particularly in education, they've just been shoving and shoving away, making it worse and worse. It's a lot worse than it was right at the before the match came into, into power, despite the much lower number of, of people who are religious. Maybe we're starting to come to the end, uh, the signs of the end of that period of hegemony are, are there, and we really must make the best of it. Thank you very much indeed.
where God learned to win. The question I have is, I'm very interested in politics and publicity, but you seem to have put heads or incredible lights on the very big bushel. And surely the next big test will be when we have the issue of the succession of the Queen. What is going to happen when Prince Charles, who I quite frankly despise, becomes <laughs> so-called king? But his past record to be head of a, of a church seems unbelievable to me. What are your views? Yeah, I, I think that uh, I, I share your, your republicanism. Uh, and I think most of the members of the National Secular Society do. Obviously, it was it was founded by Charles Bradlaugh, an arch Republican. Um, I think a lot of that has dwindled a little bit because the the, um, the royal family and the monarchy keeps reinventing itself for the next generation. It's very good at doing that. It's it's still very popular, um, and we we've got an uphill battle to make any inroads into abolishing the monarchy. And it's not everybody in the NSS who wants to abolish the monarchy, but uh, to separate it, like the church, from the state uh, might be one way of approaching this, to have a secular monarchy that then you can then have all, all the, the kind of tower diddle and the, you know, the, the parades and, and the queen waving from the balcony and all that kind of rubbish. Um, but, but it does seem to appeal to a lot of people. It brings people together. In, and if it was a secular monarchy, um, I think it might, might just be justifiable. Um, I know there are a lot of people who won't agree with me, but I do agree with you about Prince Charles. He's overstepping the mark. He's, he's interfering in, in uh, politics in a way that his mother never did. And um, I don't think it's right for any monarch to have any kind of political role. Well, I know she's head of state, but she keeps her counsel as regards her own politics. He doesn't. Um, and when these letters that he's written, the so-called spider letters that he wrote to ministers that's been so long been, uh, made, to be made public, a long um, legal challenge before they were made public, and they will be published soon, and we'll, we will see the extent to which he has interfered or tried to interfere in government decision-making. Um, and that may well make him even more unpopular than he is at the moment. I don't know if you saw the, the poll that came out yesterday showing that more than half of the population don't think he should ever be king and that he should step aside <laughs> and, and allow uh, the other one, the government, the prince, whatever he's called, <laughs> yeah, that one, to, um, to, to, to go straight onto the throne. And I, I think, well, I don't really care which of them is on the throne, but. Uh, you know, the, Prince Charles is a disaster waiting to happen. He might actually finish the monarchy off. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, could I make, could I, I'm, yes, not yes, um, I'm not disagreeing with, with anything that Terry has said. But there are some additional points which I, I find um, that I, I find are more um, that, that we also need to consider about the, the process um, and. I, I'm affronted, and I do say so whenever I get the opportunity to say how affronted I am about the process of the coronation, that the coronation should be a religious service, an Anglican service, an Anglican service even part of which not even the people in the cathedral can see the anointing of the oil and it's put under a kind of cloak or something. They kind of talk about medieval mumbo jumbo. Um, so, the idea that the accession of a head of state, ignoring the fact that it's a hereditary one and that the Queen happens or the monarch is the uh, ex officio, the supreme governor of the established church, or got that quite aside, just the fact that it's the head of state that is done in a, in a religious service that isn't uh, subscribed to by. Uh, by any significant percentage of the population is absolutely scandalous. And you will remember too that uh, something quite sinister in my mind 
that Charles is suggesting that he will be defender of faith not the faith I have to, have to say in fact you'll disagree with me but I don't, I'd actually prefer the faith in the sense that um, some of the others I'm not sure should be defended with quite such vigour um, and although I agree in the interest of equality perhaps they should be but I would prefer it to be of no faith whatsoever that there is no religious affiliation there at all the idea that the monarch should be defending faith and telling people who haven't got faith by implication that they're less important uh, is quite disgraceful uh, so that also segues rather uncomfortably into the question of what kind of establishment will we have under Charles and I think what he will be uh, agitating for as in his defender of faith is multi-faith establishment and that terrifies me absolutely terrifies me um, and I would prefer what we've got at the moment to that and we really must do everything we can to try and dismantle it before it gets to that stage but it won't be easy uh, but I think we ought to focus on that particular issue with, with some engine. Thank you. Could you get to Chris first, uh, and then John? Thanks, Hello. Hello. Um, I'm sitting on the uh, Dorset uh, local sacred sacra, and. Could I ask you what the NSS position is on uh, converting the RE syllabus into a, perhaps a historical, being part of this history syllabus? Um, that's really my question. Chris, can you just briefly explain what SACRA is? Yeah, it's the Standing Advisory Committee on Religious Education. Yeah, most local authorities have one of these committees and, and they advise community schools on their religious education syllabus. Um, they're usually made up of um, an awful lot of religious worthies with a, a vested interest, and I know that a few of them have got humanists on the, on the uh, committee. Um, I'm not too happy about sacraments. I think that they, they are vested interests, and they, they are there to uh, make sure that religion is pumped into kids at school. Um, I would much rather there was some kind of national curriculum on religious education if we are going to have a subject called religious education. I agree with you, it should be assimilated into, into other topic areas like history and literature and so on, um, geography. Uh, but I think that... Now that's not really big. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so um, Sacrae's I'm not, I'm not too thrilled about. And I have to say, this is one of the beliefs I have with humanism: um, is that humanists want also to be on some some humanists want, want to be on on the syllabus along with religion, and quite often that uh, allows religion to say, look, we're all inclusive. Isn't it marvellous? We've got everybody in now, even the atheists. And then they get into schools, humanism has forgotten about. And it's the same old thing, you know, religion day in, day out, day in, day out. I'm not too happy about that. And I would prefer, well, we, we discourage our members from being on the sacraments because of that uh, legitimising effect that our presence has on them. We think that um, it would be much better for religious ed education to be standardised by a group of independent academics who are not going to uh, give it an edge of proselytising or, or evangelising, which often it has now. Um, and uh, so, yes, I agree with you. It should be incorporated into other topics. RE as a topic area should disappear. Thank you. John. Thanks. Um, just a simple question. Do you take encouragement from the fact that at the moment uh, two out of the three main party leaders are non-religious? The general election coming up? Um, well, no, not really, because um, although they, they are declared atheists, they were both uh, on a religious hosting a couple of weeks ago, and they were both making extravagant claims about how they were going to make sure that religion remained as part of the 
the state and that they were going to make sure that religion had a big part in decision making. And uh, Nick Clay was actually saying that he envied people of faith, and he was he was very sorry that he didn't have a faith. Um, and similarly, um, Ed Miliband, although he's from a Jewish background, you know, he's a secular Jew who, who will say quite clearly that he has no religious beliefs. But again, he was a, you know he's, I know it's an election and they've got to appeal to all um, all these constituencies, but to sort of try and make out that religion brought such wonderful morality to public life, uh, and without it, wouldn't it be awful? We'd all be at each other's throats. Um, so no, they, they, they don't thrill me. Their, their, their lack of religion has got no uh, benefit for the secular or humanist movement. Um, until they can actually <coughs> say, yes, we would be better off with a secular society, neither of them have them. Um, uh, until they can say that, I don't think there's any benefit in, in their being, but not really. It's preferable maybe for Tony Blair and uh, David Cannon. Yeah, but uh, I mean, at least you know where you're coming from with that. You know, well, maybe not with David Cameron, because he was, he was also uh, interviewed by the same uh, religious newspaper, Premier Christianity, it was called. You can read all their uh, interviews on that website. And uh, he was saying, you know, well, basically what he said was, I don't believe a word of it, but isn't it wonderful? <laughs> you know, it was very, a very strange interview. He, he, he couldn't quite bring himself to say that he believed it you know, completely, every, every job and tittle. Um, and yet he is a wonderful, wonderful Christian underneath it all. Talking about Mr. Blair, <coughs> talking about Mr. Blair, uh, about ten years ago we were working very hard on the transposition of the European law directive into UK law. Broadly, there should be no discrimination on the grounds of, obviously, sex, religion, sexuality, etc. Civility. Um, and we were fighting very hard to make sure that the religious exemptions were minimised. And my goodness, it was hard work. And I got very soon into the we were working right at the top level of the civil servants and knew them all by first name terms. And it was very clear that they had a very short line of communication to, to number 10. And the speed with which answers were coming back, it was quite obvious that they were just going straight back to town. Um, and uh, on one occasion, one way I made the most uh, uh, progress on when, to speak to Margaret Hodge as the uh, Qualities Minister, and I set out our still what was a, an hour's meeting turned into a two hour meeting, which is almost unknown with a minister. Beautiful office overlooking the whole Scotland's praying in the real business. And she said, I'm totally convinced what, with what you said, I'll go back to tell you. She lost her job in a fortnight. <laughs> And I feel really, really bad about her. She's a decent woman, absolutely spot on, and he just wouldn't pay. He was terrible over all of that. Um, so uh, the, the whole point about Blair, that Terry was hinting about, is um, when Alistair uh, uh, Carroll said, uh, we don't do religion, of course, as we now know, when we guessed at the time. It was a complete and utter lie. But he knew, he knew that religion, people, politics, but politicians wearing religion on their sleeve goes down very badly. And uh, so we better say no, even though it's untrue. Um, but just uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was the first hustings debate uh, run by the Times Educational Supplement with the front bench spokespersons for education of the three main parties, or what we currently think of the three main parties. And uh, there were questions I made sure about both the future of religious schools and about collective worship. And uh, all three gave the wrong answer on the future of religious schools. Uh, and all but one gave the wrong answer on collective worship. 
the one to give the right answer was the Lib Dems and they said no, not compulsory, up to the school um, and that was because of uh, campaigning that Evan Harris, one of our associates, not as well, uh, has done on that area with the Lib Dems. Um, but I don't think the Lib Dem policy is going to count for very much necessarily. But um, that was the only bright spot of a, of quite a depressing debate in that respect. Richard. Yeah, I you already identified one significant difference between yourselves and the BHA regarding sacraments, for example, but on many, many other issues, we're fighting the same cause, I think. Uh, is there more room to support each other, uh, to gain a little bit more weight of numbers? Uh, should we not be working more closely together? Well, of course, we do occasionally work together on, on things like the protests of hope um, issue. We, we work very closely with the DHA on that, as well as several other organisations. Um, I think the difference between the BHA and the NSS is that the BHA provides a kind of alternative structure for people who want to have some kind of philosophical basis for their life, whereas the NSS is a, is a much narrower aims. It's a political pressure group. We're, we're there with a very particular aim in mind. We're not there to provide an alternative life stance, if you like. We're there to simply lobby for a secular society. And yes, there's a, a crossover in campaigning. Uh, but I think uh, we, on occasions, we are aiming for a different kind of secularism to the BHA. Um, the BHA will often um, include itself uh, in multi-faith or interfaith yeah. initiatives, uh, which are fine on most occasions, although I think they're pretty useless. As I think even the Archbishop of Canterbury said the other day, they're nice people talking about nice things, and the people who really need to be involved in interfaith or multi-faith initiatives are the very people who go anywhere near them, the fanatics and the loonies. Um, they're the people who, who you need to calm down, not the people who are already uh, people of goodwill within religions. Um, so we, we wouldn't go in for these initiatives with uh, you know, these, these kind of things. The, the, one of the differences we've had with the DHA recently is over this Wolf Committee. I don't know if you know about it. This self-appointed group of worthies who are doing research into the position of religion in British society um, and they've recruited um, the BHA onto this commission to, to be part of it. Um, when you look at the, the, um, the biographies of the people, the other people who are on the commission, they are all terribly, terribly high up in religious circles. They're either priests or they're, they're, they've got some other very strong religious affiliation. Yeah, and you know, they're, they're, they're from all religions, uh, admittedly, but you know, they, they, they've all got a very vested interest. And in when they came to us to give evidence to them, as they called it, um, we decided not to do it because we decided that we did not want to give this commission any kind of legitimacy. It, we could write their report now, months before it's even due to be published. We could sit down and write what they're going to say. Um, so we wouldn't have anything to do with that. Um, and I think this is the kind of area where, where we are company a bit with the BHA. We work with them on areas where we can agree, but I think uh, this, this inclusive secularism that they, they prefer is not the kind of secularism that will work for the NSS. We, we're much more uh, into the uh, separation of religion from the state. Clear separation, not an inclusive one. Can I, can I just come back briefly? Yeah, briefly, yeah. Uh, Given, given that, let's say Christianity uh, and, and the other religions, let's stick to Christianity for a minute. Um, whilst it's kind of slowly dying, I think, in this country, it's a very slow death. It's going to be around, it's going to be supported by powerful people for a very long time to come. 
So it's a fact of life. There they are. Isn't the BHA line where we kind of accept that's the case, um, and since they're there, try and work with them? Isn't that going to be more fruitful? Well, um, yes, but working with them, for what end? Do you know, to, to get them more privileged, or to, to make sure that they're still taken note of? Um, we would rather that they did die, um, however slowly. But, you know, we're not going to make any kind of active attempt to undermine religion. But then again, we're not going to help it to, to re maintain its power. Um, and that's why we see state care of these organisations. I think you're perceived to be trying to undermine religion. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Yes, there's an irony in that, actually, because I think the, the, the whole point of humanism is, is, is really a, a non-religious perspective, whereas the NSS, certainly in recent years, um, is, is neutral on the point of religion. And if you look carefully about what we've done, I agree there is a perception, I, I, I don't disagree with that point, and that uh, uh, it isn't actually correct that we don't attack religion per se. But uh, there are many people who suggest that I'm gentle where I think that they're crossing the line on, on uh, religious privilege. I, I show no mercy, mercy on that. And, and on your cooperation point, um, going back 10, 15 years, the NSS and the various the NHA and various other organisations used to share the same address. Um, and the perception was that effectively it was one organisation with a few less hands. That, that actually made our small numbers look even smaller. It's far better for, for uh, uh, an independent view to come and sometimes be subtly and sometimes not that subtly different. Um, uh, and uh, rather than appear to be just a, 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 a sub-department of the same thing. So it's probably we give a stronger opinion uh, at the movement in inverted commas appears stronger if we actually keep that room. We're up against time, but I have got two, two people waiting to ask questions. So if we can take both of those questions first, and then, so briefly please, and then brief answers. So Bill first, and then Elaine. Can you hear me? Just, yeah, that's right, speaking to um, One of the reasons why I joined the humanists and didn't join the NSS um, precisely the one you mentioned just now, but I think you're a fighting organisation. Um, um, my view, although I've been an atheist for, since I was 17, I realised that for some people, religion is a sort of comfort. Um, I think people who probably, uh, in their heart of hearts, don't believe in God, like to think of it because they don't like the, the idea of death being an end. So, in a sense, I think the difference between us is that you're like the people who build a hole and put explosives in the wall to knock it down, whereas we have people with mix tackling everything at a time. Can I, can I take the other question as well? I have to say, um, I mean, it, obviously it's your choice uh, as to whether you join the NSS or not. Um, I, I have to say there's all the literature at the back there and I have uh, uh, annual reports and bulletins and I hope you'll take them away with you. And there's also membership forms there and obviously the, the, the campaigning does cost a lot of money. Uh, and the more money we have, the more campaigning we can do. So I hope some of you will individually join rather than just as, uh, as affiliates through, 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 through Dorset. Um, but I, I couldn't disagree with you more on the point of principle. Your choice, uh, obviously, about uh, joining. But your characterization is, I think, the arguments you give me are a reason why you should join the NSS and not the BHA. I'm not attacking the BHA, but just on your own logic. Your own. We don't say that religion is rubbish, I'm most of us think it is, but we don't, we never see the NSS saying that now. Not for 10, 20 years. We actually are talking about secularism, which is here to protect all of us. We're not telling people that their beliefs are stupid. 
So, whereas that is, you can't say that for the VHA, because the VHA does actually talk about the rational or the irrationality of religion. So I'm afraid you've backed the wrong... <laughs> you, you've actually backed the wrong horse. And I do look forward to seeing your name on the bench. <laughs> actually joined, subscribed, and, and signed up to our principles, and if they don't like, we don't take public money, we don't take uh, money from grants or any, anywhere else. It's all from our members, <coughs> and from, you know, 150 years of accumulation, so we do have quite a lot. Um, but I think the, uh, the idea that, well, I'm not quite sure what, what the point was you were making, that, that we, we were speaking sort of illegitimately or something. No, I'm just wondering how much you have a base membership rather than just a concentrated people, the centre, who um, make these decisions. Oh, yeah. how, how, how many people <coughs> do you have? We were a democratic organisation and we've got, what, maybe 7,000 members I don't know exactly, because I'm, I'm, I'm only the president, I don't work in the office, I have to be elected every year. Um, but it's, um, it's an organisation that's democratically uh, run. We have an AGM every year, we have consultation with members, and you know, we, we, if we're making any kind of policy decision or change to our constitution, it has to be approved by 75% of the members who attend the AGM. So, you know, we don't just make, make it up on the roof. We, it is a democratically run organisation. Well, um, Keith and Terry, uh, you've given us a great insight into the work of the NSS today. So thank you very much for coming down. And uh, as I say, it's great to have two for the price of one. So please, a lovely round of applause. <laughs> We didn't know they were, we were, both of them were coming. I've only got one bottle of wine, so I'll give that to Keith. <laughs> <laughs> no, we definitely share. You can share, you can share, okay. So, uh, just a few notes.